you're a World Cup winner, you have two Olympic medals, but we're here to talk about concussion, something that, that has impacted your sports career in a major way. Can you tell me about it? Sure. And for those of you that don't know, I played for the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team, um, World Cup Olympics. And in 2001, I suffered my first diagnosed concussion. And I say diagnosed because what I didn't know then is that every time I saw stars, that was also a concussion. But it, I thought it was just a part of the game. So my first diagnosed concussion was in 2001, and I suffered a lot of symptoms from that first concussion, headaches, fatigue, jaw pain. And, but I was able to sit out a couple of weeks and rejoin my team and continue competing. Even though I was suffering from these symptoms, I saw a neurologist. They put me on various medications to try to deal with the symptoms, prevent the symptoms, and then also deal with them once I had them. And, and I went along with that for a while. And then in the 2003 World Cup, I suffered my second diagnosed concussion, which would be much worse than my first one. It would put me out of the game for a couple months. But I couldn't relax. I had to get back to training because the 2004 Olympics were coming up the following year. And in, two, in January of 2004, I rejoined the US Women's National Team for our first training camp since the World Cup. And I remember getting down to the soccer field. We we're getting ready to train, and I was very particular about how tight I tied my cleats. It was kind of my thing, because um, I'm really pigeon-toed, so I had to tuck, tie them really tight and then tuck the loops into my cleats so I wouldn't trip over myself. Um, and I remember I, all of a sudden I couldn't tie my shoes tight enough. My fingers weren't quite working. And the next thing I know is I was waking up in the MRI machine and I had just been diagnosed with a TIA or mini stroke. And what's surprising about that moment was not how fearful it was and, or concerned I was, but how quickly they returned me to play. I rejoined the same camp and never, no one ever really said anything afterwards. And then, and that's kind of when things changed for me. I was the, I was the player who not only loved training, but I loved everything about the game. I loved every aspect of it. And I, I would love to get down to the training grounds and to play. And all of a sudden that changed because I was having headaches all the time. I was extremely fatigued. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get fed. I was trying to get fitter and I couldn't get fed and it was just creating this vicious cycle of fatigue and headaches. Um, and then when the 2004 Olympic roster was about to be named, I was secretly wishing that my name wouldn't be on it. I mean, this was the Olympic roster and here I was hoping my name wouldn't be on it because for me as an elite athlete, it was easier for me psychologically to be cut than to quit my team and quit my teammates. Um, but fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, I was playing well enough to make the team. We went on to win the gold medal that year. And I was very excited for my team and my teammates, but I knew after that Olympics that I needed to take some time off to try and recover from my post-concussion syndrome. And I tried to recover for a couple years, but things weren't getting better. I was trying to prepare for the 2007 World Cup. And it was at that point when I wasn't getting better in 2006 that uh, I consulted my family and doctors and decided to retire. Rod, you've seen a couple of players, including Kevin McLaughlin, the Leinster captain, retire from concussion this year. Are you surprised by anything, what, any of, of, of the details in Cindy's story? No, not at all. Uh, for us, the biggest thing we've had to do is change a culture. So when we surveyed our professional players in 2010 and 11. 80% of them uh, didn't think concussion was serious, and 70% of them didn't even realize they had a concussion. So that, I think, is in keeping with some of what Cindy says. Um, so we've had to work hard at changing the culture, and that involves educating players so they understand what, what a concussion is and the seriousness of it. But the other part of it is, is also putting it in a performance setting. And, and Cindy touched on it in terms of what was important to her was getting to the next event, the games. So we have to get into the mindset of coaches, and part of that mindset is, is about winning, certainly at the elite high performance level. So what we're trying to, the culture change we've had to try and drive is that you are better off with your second best player who is not concussed than having your concussed best player on. And other teams are smart. They will target the last injured player as a potential weakness for the next attack. I'm thrilled to see Cindy here because I think the next cultural change we have to have happens to ha has to happen within Ireland. And that is 
at the moment we have a culture and a belief within Ireland that the only place you can get concussion is on a rugby pitch, which is crazy. Cindy clearly chose this example. This can happen on any sporting pitch. And what we need is actually people to understand that. Do you think that that is because rugby have almost put their hands up and said, look, we have this concussion problem and we're going to tackle it. It's because you've recognized it. I think that's a significant part of it. I think we have to also accept the reality of the nature of our game is that we probably do have a higher incidence of concussion than other sports. But yes, we've set a very low bar in terms of diagnosing concussion. So if you run into somebody on a rugby pitch, no clash of heads, you fall to the ground and one of you staggers getting up. Under rugby rules, they're off with suspected concussion. If you apply that to most other sports in Ireland, I think you'd be watching games where you would be demanding many other people off. It is really interesting to watch the media watch a rugby match and look where's the next concussion. And then the same people watching a different sport see the same instance and it doesn't even cross their mind that there may be a concussion just after occurring. It's a real cultural issue for us. Cindy, what's the culture like for you then in, in America for a concussion? I think, it, it, I think awareness is growing. And at first it started off, everyone thought it was an American football problem in the States. But slowly they're realizing that it affects all contact sports, both genders. Um, and we're finding in research that women's soccer is the second leading sport behind American football for number of concussions per hours played. Rod, you said there that there's a lot of focus on rugby. It's the sport that people now watch. Do you think that that's going to change, though, as you are developing your strategy? I think, people, I think if you look at the... Uh, three or four years ago, you would have looked at a rugby match and you would have seen the crowd actually clap and be happy when a player with an injury and potentially concussion go back on. That culture is changing. You now see... Um, a lot of people since the World Cup final have said to me they were just so happy that Matt Gitto, the Australian, didn't go back on. So when the crowd are beginning to react like that, you, you know that you're maybe beginning to, to win part of the cultural battle um, and, and the issue. I, I do think uh, we are also looking at other things to try. And, so that's about recognizing it. We need to also look at how we cut down the instance of concussion. So how do we prevent it ever happening? So one of the other things that happened at the World Cup, for example, was um, a great focus on any tackle that was close to the, to the neck and therefore has a higher risk of causing a concussion. Um, and I think that reflected in, well, we haven't got the figures yet, but certainly a perception that it was less potential concussions in this World Cup. Um, so we are looking now and moving to potential rule changes and things that will do things to help prevent these ever happening, as well as properly diagnosing it and then a good management when it occurs. In the Rugby World Cup this year, there was access to the Hawkeye, to the, to the sure. feeds, the, the 17 cameras. How beneficial is it to have this extra tool when you're looking at concussion? Hugely beneficial. What we've had for a number of years is we've had the medical staff, uh, you know, being judged by what the television people at home can see. And they haven't see, see that. If you're ever on the side of a pitch, you realize you can't see the far side of a pitch if you're on the sideline. So what we had is our medical staff and the management of concussion being judged by what Sky can then slow down and show. So for the World Cup, as you say, we had 18 potential views and ability to replay and, and, and play those back. Um, and all that helps better the, the management of concussion. Um, we've had that at the Aviva for a number of years, not the 18 views, but the use of video, and it's been hugely helpful. And it's something we've offered to the visiting teams. Um, and again, it's interesting because one of the challenges for us in that was the coach's concern that there's a potential performance of benefit to the other side to offering the other side a video that will show them things. So these are all the things that we have to interact with. Cindy, your company, tell me about it, is also developing technological ways to try and help to get some, an extra tool to, to recognize concussion. Right, I'm CEO of a company called Inver. Um, it came out of Duke University in the States. And we've developed an in-ear device that measures head impact and rotation to help medical professionals better detect which athletes or military personnel need to be checked out further for concussion symptoms. Because um, for me as a coach, and then if you ask athletic trainers, and as Rod has, has told you as well, detecting concussions is one of the most challenging things in dealing with concussions, because we don't know who needs to be checked out further for concussions? So this is another tool to help medical professionals or coaches or parents 
just decide, oh, that was a significant hit. We should probably check them out real quick for concussion symptoms. Because um, about 3.8 million concussions happen in sport every year. And it's estimated that up to 85% of the concussions go undetected and thus undiagnosed. And I know from personal experience what that can look like if, you're, if you don't properly recover from a concussion, concussion before returning to play. So um, we're trying to move the mark in this direction to help give more information to maybe find find some ways to actually diagnose concussions in real time. There's people working on biomarkers and, and other things that I think Rod can talk a little bit more about. But um, it's a really exciting company. And if you'd love to hear more about it, come find me. Cindy, as a coach, are you worried about you know kids and the future and the impact of all this, all the concussions that they get that might not that might not be recognized in the future. Well, not only kids, but every level. I've coached from youth to the collegiate level in the states, as well as professionally. And detecting concussions is a is a challenge at every level. I think, especially at the youth level, because we don't have medical professionals at all their games. So if I if someone gets hit in the head, which happens often in soccer, because you're heading the soccer ball quite a bit. I don't have anyone to send them to to get checked out. I'm not educated enough and have the skills to actually do a diagnosis. So I have no choice but to sit them out. But I'm not always, I'm diligently looking for players that could possibly be injured. But I know for a fact that I've missed it. Um, and this is one of the big reasons I'm a part of a campaign in the States. It's called Safer Soccer to try to eliminate heading before the age of 14. And the reason for this is quite a few reasons. One, to delay the onset of the sub-concussive hits, so re repetitive hits to the head with the soccer ball. But about 30% of concussions in soccer or football, depending on where you're from, occur during the act of heading. So not the actual heading of the ball, but head-to-head -head co collisions, elbow-to-head, or falling after heading the ball and hitting your head on the ground. So just by changing this one rule, we can eliminate 30% of concussions in our youngest athletes. As they're developing, their brains are developing, they can have this increased myelination, um, as well as a little bit more coordination. Because those of you that don't know much about, uh, about soccer or football, um, heading is a very coordinative skill. It's not just the head. It's a full body skill to learn. And kids, after they go through puberty, are much more able to do this coordinative skill correctly. Rod, Cindy mentioned possible potential rule changes or, or bringing in laws that would stop kids heading. Is there anything that you think that could work in rugby that think, could help eliminate concussion? I think there's two parts to that. There is the application of a law and there's the adequacy of the laws. And what we've seen is, is when rugby has, because of the potential risk of concussion, focused on the application of the high tackle law, that has a significant effect. In rugby, there's a lot of talk about should we lower the height of the tackle? And when we look at concussion, what we're also seeing is, is that people get concussed tackling low when, uh, when somebody's knee hits their head. So we are at the moment involved with uh, a study with Ulster Rugby in which we are looking this year, it's a follow-on from last year, in which we're looking specifically at the height of the tackle and concussion to see does that make any difference. What we don't want to do is change the height of the tackle and find that all we've done is, is, is potentially put up the instance of concussion. But, we're, but so in answer to your question, there's two things. There is the application and enforcement of the appropriate law, and we are looking to see other things that law changes would make a difference to, but we want them driven by research and evidence. We keep coming back to the coaches, and again, if there was a case where it came in at youth level because you can't, World Rugby would have to make the changes at the top sure. level. Is this something that coaches would be for considering that performance and winning is really important to them? Yeah, I, that is always the challenge we have, that, that as far as coaches are concerned, <laughs> you know, there is that culture out there, but hopefully changing, that it's about performance and winning. But what we hopefully are doing is developing players for the longer term. So if we introduce something in the, for their safety uh, at a younger level, in the end, we will have better performing teams if that's what you're about, if it's just about winning for you. There are lots of aspects of rugby that are uh, about um, enjoyment. Um, so for example, in rugby, we don't keep the score under 12 because we're not interested, despite what people think. There, is no, there should be no scorekeeping on, you know, in, in the under 12-year-olds. Um, because. That's the thing that gets lost in this argument. There's a lot of fear and concern out there 
about concussion and its risks on health. When actually, if you have people giving up sport and activity for a not yet defined risk, then you actually have people who are going to get other illnesses. You know, we have America, they, they talk a lot about, about its obesity pr problem and the health problems that causes, and we're in the middle of one ourselves. So it, people seem to think that the driving of the fear and, and trying to, and, you know, and, oh, I'll stop my child doing that, means that they are healthier, safer. So there's, you know, not necessarily. They are just then going to get other health risks later in life. So, Rod, do you think concussion is a genuine big problem or are we just in a stage where we're focusing on it? I think concussion is a genuine problem that needs to be recognized and managed appropriately. And the vast majority of managed appropriately will have no long-term effects. Obviously, Cindy is an example of where some small numbers can. I do think that we are in an era at the moment where there is a lot of focus on it and some of the coverage is inappropriate. For example, playing a rugby match, about there is one concussion in every 30. That means the vast majority of our children will go through a season and not be concussed. The way the media cover it, you think everyone is going to get concussed every game. And, and there has to be a balance, because that sort of coverage isn't without its concerns. Cindy, you're sitting there beside Rada, and you've, you are the statistic. Do you think what he's saying is correct, that it is a little bit of a media hype there? Well, I think there is great concern about concussions, and there should be. Um, we only have one brain, it's, and it, it's an injury that is challenging on so many levels because it's not like a broken leg or a torn ACL. You can see these injuries, and the coach understands, the athletic trainer understands, and the player understands, oh, my leg is broken, I need to sit out. Um, but when you come to someone, I have headaches, I don't feel right, um, I'm tired. Yeah, yeah, everyone's tired. This is elite athletics. I think, I think it's a very challenging injury um, from that standpoint. But also on the flip side of it, I am the person I am today because of sport. Sport gave me so many things. I was a very quiet, quiet, shy kid. Um, you wouldn't know it today because you can't get me to shut up. Um, but it was kind of my outlet. It taught me so many things. And one of the great things that I took away from sport, besides all the life skills, was how to become a leader. And this has transitioned me from on the field to being a player to then a coach and now CEO of a company. Um, and I am applying those same skills that I learned throughout the years um, as a youth through college as well professionally with the women's national team. And I'm applying those same skills that I learned. So I think sport, um, you talked about the physical side and what you gain from there physically and um, trying to combat obesity and diabetes and all these other things. But also, in terms of just character development and life skills development, sport gives you so much. So I think we do need to be concerned about concussions, but we also need to have it in perspective that there are a lot of great things that come from sport. And that's why I'm a huge proponent of just making the sport safer. I don't want kids to quit playing sports because sports have given me so much and I, uh, I would be a little bit of a hypocrite to t tell them not to play sports. Um, I think I would encourage kids to continue to play sports, but also to be aware of this risk and to continue educating themselves, the parents being educated, coaches, on what a concussion is, what the symptoms are, what to look out for, how to deal with it once you do have one. Well, guys, that's all we have time for. Thanks very much for joining me. And, Thanks, uh, everyone. Best of luck over the next Thank few you. days, Cindy.